Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Today's episode is going to be a slightly different one than normal. Due to some scheduling conflicts, unfortunately, I was not able to get a guest lined up for this week, but I thought that this would be a perfect opportunity to throw things back and do a little replay of one of my favorite episodes of this podcast, which was episode 17 with Sylvia Massey. I absolutely love Sylvia so much. She is such an amazing engineer. And it was honestly one of my first interviews where I was kind of nervous going into it. She's an engineer who I really respect. She was also one of the first big names that I had on the podcast, too. So uh, I think listening back to it, you can maybe kind of hear some of my early nerves going on with this podcast. You know, it's kind of uh, you can hear some of the early, early mic, early podcast days. And uh, you can really see how the podcast has grown and how my confidence in, in interviewing people has grown as well. But yeah, I know that this episode was definitely a fan favorite and a lot of people who have heard this episode already have reached out to me to share their thoughts of how this episode was inspiring and how it gets your creative juices going. And that's exactly what Sylvia is great at. So yeah, I figured that this episode would be a great episode to go back to. So with that said, let's dive into it. And then next week, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled program. I've got a ton of great interviews lined up, and I'm looking forward to those as well. But for now, let's go back to episode 17 with Sylvia Massey. Today's guest is Sylvia Massey, and I am so stoked to have her on. I think that Sylvia is one of the most creative engineers out there, and I really love her approach to recording. If you're not too familiar with her, she's a music producer who has been awarded over 25 gold and platinum records. She's got several Grammy-nominated albums. She's worked with a ton of major acts such as Tool, System of a Down, Johnny Cash, Prince, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you name it. And she's really well known for her unusual and sometimes dangerous production techniques. She's actually recently come out with a book called Recording Unhinged, Creative and Unconventional Music Recording Techniques. And guys, you need to check out this book. It's an amazing book. Once you read it, you'll feel so inspired and you'll learn so many new techniques to try out and experiment with in the studio. I just absolutely loved it. I'll include a link in the show notes for where you can purchase it. You have to check it out. It's an amazing book. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear this interview. So let's dive right in. Sylvia, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Sure, you bet. So for people who might not be familiar with your story and who you are and how you got started, can you give me a little bit of background on on your journey becoming an engineer? Sure. I went to university in Chico, California and uh, uh, got involved with college radio. And that's where I learned how to use the equipment uh, for recording and editing. And... um, Then I got involved in my own band and used some of that radio station equipment to record that band. And I, and it turned out pretty good. So other people asked me to record them too. So from the very beginning, I, I was producing. So it wasn't something that I grew into. It was, it was what was needed at the time at the beginning. As I continued to produce other people, I uh, created a pretty good discography and attracted some new artist to, uh, to inquire about my services. And that's when I got involved with a couple record labels, indie record labels. And I did a lot of San Francisco punk and, uh, that was a great experience that led me to work, uh, with Kirk Hammett on a co-production of a band called the Sea Hags. And, uh, they got a deal with a major label and went to Los Angeles to record that. I was a bit disappointed that they didn't use me for the their major label project, but that was the point when I realized that I, if I really wanted to have a career in music producing and mixing and engineering, I really had to go to Los Angeles because at the time I was living in San Francisco. And um, so I packed up and I went to LA. I couldn't really get a studio job when I first got into town because no one knew me. Uh, so I basically started from ground up and was working at Tower Records when I met people in a band called Green Jello. And that was a, a band. They they eventually changed their name because General uh, General Foods said, no, you can't use that. Hmm. You can't use Jello. So they changed it to Green Jelly. But the uh, couple members of that band were in a band, another band called Tool. 
So I managed to uh, get Green Jello in the studio and produce a record with them. And that led to a um, their major label release, which did very well. They had a song called Three Little Pigs that hit the charts. Um, in the, I think they were number 24 in the top 100 um, for a while. And that was a, a big feat, especially for a metal version of a nursery rhyme. Uh, but the, one of the singers in that single um, was Maynard James Keenan, and he sang the part in the song, uh, the Green Jelly song, that went, um, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. <laughs> and uh, so I had a connection there with Tool, and we went in the studio, and, and uh, I produced, uh, I recorded and produced a couple records with them. Those did very well and led me to work with several other uh, good names, including, uh, oh, let's see, System of a Down and, um, oh boy, there's a, there's a bunch, uh, R.E.M., uh, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Chili Peppers, Johnny Cash, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Wow, those are all amazing. Yeah, so I, I've been busy at it for about 30 years now. And I managed to leave Los Angeles at one point when I felt I didn't really need to be in the city anymore. And I moved out to the country. I live in Oregon now, and I have a studio in uh, Ashland, Oregon. And I do work here in Oregon, and then I do a lot of traveling, too. That's awesome. Yeah. So what instruments do you play? I play drums and I sing. I, I grew up in a musical household. Uh, my mother was an opera singer and my father actually was an engineer who built his own electronics. So I kind of had the best of both worlds there uh, while I was growing up. So my mother was a singer and she sang to me when I was a baby and it was kind of in my blood. So I sing. I'm not nearly as good as my mother, but I sing I, when I'm working out parts for a singer to um, do harmonies. I'll sing the part onto the recording and then play that back to the the singer and then they can understand the interval that I'm asking them to um, sing. So I do a lot of singing on projects. I don't do a lot of drum playing because I'm not really that good, <laughs> but I love playing drums. It's a, it's a joy to play drums. Yep. It's a, it's a lot of fun. They're a good stress release too. I'm, I'm a drummer personally, so okay, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah. Tell me a little bit about your studio setup these days. What kind of gear do you have? I've got two rooms set up right now. One is is a room that I normally record in, and that has a Neve 8038 console. It's a vintage 1972, and it has 1073 EQs, and I'm so lucky to have that board um, because no matter what you plug into it, it just sounds like magic. No, it's a, um, it, it makes my job very easy when we record. Um, I also have a mix room and the mix room has an iMac. It's a, a real uh, powerful one actually with a HDX interface and every plugin that I can get my hands on is in that rig, including the UA, the waves, the isotope, the, the Steven slate and the slate digital and, um, many others, which I'm, I'm really loving. Like sound, sound toys is fantastic. Um, so it, I have a loaded rig and that's my mix, my mix rig. But recently I've changed the style, the, the way that I mix. And now I'm using a hybrid approach because it was very difficult for me to move from analog mixing on the Neve console with flying faders, which is, uh, you know, it's prehistoric at this point Yeah, to, to work that way. Uh, and very difficult to do recalls. I went from that directly into mixing in the box and I found it very difficult because I, I thought, I think that the sound kind of gets bottlenecked. Um, it gets pinched when you're mixing in the box to two tracks. I went, especially if you have a large session and you're, you know, running a hundred tracks and you're trying to squeeze it all into two tracks. So I've started doing a hybrid approach and I've moved my mix computer into the tracking room. And I um, send all my, uh, I, I, I submix to stems, different, the different instruments in a mix will each have a stem. So I'll have a stereo stem for drums, a stereo stem for bass, a stereo stem for guitars, keyboards, 
vocals, etc. And those will all come up on the neve now in stereo pairs. So these these submixes or stems all come up to uh, faders on the neve set around zero. And I then can use outboard processing, analog uh, outboard processing for the stereo bus. So I can use a stereo bus EQ, like a GML 8200 is normally what I use. And um, a Loop Trotter Monster, which is a, a really nice uh, tube compressor on the stereo bus. And those are both analog. So now it, it my mixes sound less pinched and more open and more exciting, I think. Uh, you just get that extra goodness from the Neve that I was really missing when I was mixing entirely in the box. That's very cool. I like that. When you're producing, how involved do you like to get in the production side of the album? Are you working on, obviously from an engineering standpoint, you're doing a lot of creative moves there, but when it comes to uh, song structure and that kind of stuff, how involved do you typically get with that kind of thing? When I start on a production, I'll listen to the material that we're planning on recording. If I'm not happy with the, um, all the songs, I'll, I'll actually give the the artist homework to, to do, whether it's... Um, rewriting a bridge or working on lyrics in the chorus or rewriting an entire song. Um, I, I'd like them to work on those things before we even step foot in the studio, because I want to be prepared with the best material possible before we go in the studio. It's just the most important thing when recording is to have good songs. Uh, some of the work we'll do in the studio when, when we're all together and we can basically do some uh, pre-production on the spot. Uh, generally, though, when we're in the studio, everyone is mic'd up and using headphones immediately, and the the final arrangement changes to the music will be done with headphones, and we can record a new idea and then all sit and listen back and discuss and re-record it. And then finally, we come to our um, our our tracking masters uh, for the production and I build from there. Uh, so, so I think it's extremely important to start with great songs before you go in the studio, if possible. Sometimes on some projects, if a band um, that I'm working with, it wants to do an EP and they say, okay, we have six songs and we want to do a six song EP. Well, I'll, I'll generally ask for more than six songs to begin with. I'll want them to present me with 25 songs. Let's look at 25 songs and let's pick the best six out of that. Um, that's something that I learned from Rick Rubin, who will ask an artist to write 100 songs or more uh, before going in the studio to do an album. So You'll how find- far in advance are you getting these bands to do all this work? Well, uh, you know, sometimes a year in advance. Um, okay. Yeah, or six months in advance. It generally, we'll figure out when we'll, we will be going in the studio and book those days ahead of time. And then we start uh, um, conversations v- by Skype and email, generally, uh, where we're sending files back and forth and getting together uh, on these calls to discuss how to improve the songs or where to go and what direction we want to go in. That's awesome. And in your opinion, what makes a good song? I like there to be um, dynamic. I, I like there to be uh, um, a message. But in particular, I want there to be hooks. And that would be musical hooks, melodies that are really sticky, uh, lyrical hooks that are um, memorable phrases that you can remember when you're finished listening to the song. Uh, I like um, an artistic story to be told, too, with color uh, color uh, of the color of sound. Um, and that's something that I do with my productions is if I can help an artist to realize their vision by me using my uh, palette of tools in the studio, then then I think we've really achieved something. But uh, yeah, I I want to have those songs. It depends on it really depends on the purpose of the recording too if it's a if it's a legacy project and it's particularly to uh, express uh, an artist's music from the heart let's say then 
then we'll work on getting the most emotion out of that music, whether it's uh, aggressive emotion or it's uh, heartbreak emotion or whatever. Um, but if it's for a commercial uh, venture that they want to release it to go on Spotify or to compete with other commercial, um, let's say, uh, pop music or rock rock music, then I'll um, I'll go in a different direction. I'll I'll want to make sure it ha- the songs have elements to compete. But I, but in particular, music is a way to express emotion without words and the the music needs to do that whether it's joy whether it's pain i want to make sure that the music really has a feeling you you um you get the message of the music when you listen to it that's great i agree with all of that so i guess going back to your idea of having an artist make multiple having more songs than you need to record what are some common mistakes that you see artists making before they enter the studio, whether it's with their writing or just when they come into the studio in general? Well, one thing that I've, I've encountered before, which um, is difficult, sometimes difficult to overcome, is if an artist writes a song and maybe this song has kind of been floating around in the repertoire for a while, they are very used to it being a certain way. And it's really hard for them to hear a new way. So if I make suggestions and say, please write, write a different intro or let's work on the lyrics, change the lyrics in the chorus. Let's write a new um, melody. Let's simplify the melody in the chorus. Well, it will be virtually impossible for the artist to come up with a new part because they, the, the old part is so embedded in their memory. Um, that seems to be something that happens time that time and time again. So I would recommend that uh, the artists are versatile and, um, and to not be entirely precious about how things are written or what happens to a song as far as changing things in the studio. There's a saying that, um, that I uh, have about, musicians and writing is if if they feel like they are giving something away like changing something that they didn't want to change just for the sake of of uh, trying a new idea or uh, getting to a new place that they want to go um and they're disappointed with the result just just remember that you have an oil well that you can just pump some more oil if you feel like you've lost a song, just write another song. So there's there should be a lot of of um, a lot of oil to uh, to <laughs> to pump out and make more music. Yep, for sure. I, I definitely understand that analogy for sure. Let's shift some gears to mixing. When you start a mix, what's your mindset going into it? Where do you typically start? What are you listening for? When I start a mix, I try to make sure my foundation is really strong and then build on that. Um, so I'll generally, I want to know what I'm getting into. First of all, if there's a rough mix of the song, I'll listen to that and kind of gain a perspective from that listen. And then I'll start by bringing up the drum tracks. I'll balance out the drum tracks Generally, if, if it's rock music, then I'll look at the drums, the kick and snare, and I'll augment. Usually, I will augment the kick and snare by duplicating those original tracks and then adding a, a sample. I use um, the uh, Stephen Slate Trigger 2 to add samples. I have a library of samples that I've collected over the years. And I'll augment the kick and snare with my own samples those won't be the loudest thing in the mix. They'll actually be tucked in underneath the the, the uh, original kick and snare just to give it a little strength. Then I will add the bass. I want I want this the frequency spectrum to be wide, so have a lot of uh, sub frequencies as well as a lot of sparkle. So I'll I'll work on that as I build the tracks. So. Uh, I use on the the bass. I'll use uh, a waves um, the JJP bass 
plug in a lot of times. And that's uh, Jack Joseph Puig's um, mm-hmm. signature uh, plug in for bass. And that allows me to manipulate the low end and the width of the bass because I like the bass to be wide. And then I, I build from there, whether it's keyboards or guitars. Um, my favorite plug in EQs are the UA. 1073 uh, emulations, just because I'm really familiar with those, the the sound of um, the um, 1073, the real one. Plus, I I think that there's you know it's a there's a fixed frequencies on those EQs, uh, and those are just they just seem to be the right settings, the right frequencies. So um, I can grab and drop these. Uh, plugins on the tracks and um and it, they seem to work all the time so uh then after i build in the the vocals the vocals i'll use a plugin on the sum uh for the vocal sum i'll use a um, slate digital virtual mix rack and they have a nice eq and i use their uh, 1176 emulation for that and after I get a relative balance, um, and, and now I, because of the way I've changed um, mixing and, and I'm doing a hybrid approach, um, I'll have all these submixes or, or stems come up on the console. And if I need to add a little uh, EQ uh, on the analog side, I'll just do a little touch of it at the end with um, the 1073s on the desk. And my final. Uh, my final step is to add the insert of a stereo bus EQ and compression on the analog bus on the uh, desk. And that, that then I usually use reference music. I'll use, um, I'll, I'll compare what my mix is doing with a commercially released uh, song that's maybe competitive but it might be a, even a different genre. What I'm listening for is the frequency spectrum and how the 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 music is um, the uh, spectrum is shaped. So that's my final step. Is I do um, some fi- some uh, comparison listens and I adjust the the EQ, which I'm using a GML 8200 EQ, and then I uh, adjust the compression. And I'm kind of heavy handed with compression, which has gotten me in trouble in the past. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just love the sound of uh, uh, big, exciting, crunchy uh, rhythms with uh, with the uh, the uh, especially the analog compression. That's awesome. So, are you usually using templates to get started, or do you start fresh on every mix? Yes, I use templates, and I have specific templates for the genre, the rock genre. And um, I the first thing I'll do is imp- import that template into a session and then move all the instruments into that that um, template. And it pretty much has most of what I'll be using in the template. So, for instance, the um, JJP bass plugin and the virtual mix rack from Slate Digital, that, that's already in the template. So it actually makes the mixing move very quickly using templates. Um, so I, I can set up a mix in a couple hours. I'll usually finish within four, but it may it may take an entire day to finish a mix, depending on the you know, the track uh, count and other factors in getting it to, to come together. For sure. So how do you know when you're done a mix then? What, what's that deciding point in your process? I kind of have a list of things that I that are must do's in, with any new mix. And once I get through that, uh, that list all the way down to the vocal level, the vocal level will probably be the, the final step is, uh, is I'll turn down the monitors to just like one click so I can barely hear the mix. And I just want to make sure then that I'm hearing the vocals and I can understand the lyrics. Usually that's what I want to do. Um, and I, and the other trick is to be able to hear the bass at extremely low levels. And when I can hear all that, um, but the depth is there for the rest of, of the mix, then I think I'm I'm finished. I like to have an extra night 
to sleep on it and come in fresh with a fresh listen in the morning. But sometimes it's hard to uh, get that luxury. So uh, I'll usually send out the mix as soon as I get through my list. Uh, I'll send out the mix to be uh, listened to by the client. And the client will bring back revision notes, if any, and we'll continue to work on it. That's awesome. Now, when I think of certain producers, I have a certain association with them. So you had mentioned Rick Rubin earlier. And and for him, you know, I think that he is like the fan producer. He makes that album that the fans want to listen to that has that classic sound. And and you kind of know what you're going to get when when you think of Rick Rubin. And and with you, I think of you as a very creative person. And, and I, you know, I've followed you online and you have all sorts of tutorials on these really creative, innovative mixing steps and processes that you do and all sorts of tricks that you've tried. And, and you even wrote a book about it, Recording Unhinged, which, by the way, is an amazing book. I, uh, Thank you. Thank I, you. I, I don't consider myself much of a reader, but I like binge read your book. Like I, I nailed it in like right. a night. I was just like addicted to it. I couldn't put it down. And one of the things that I, when I first started reading it, I kind of just expected having seen some of your stuff online, I kind of just figured that I'd open up the book and it would just be all sorts of recording techniques. And it'd be like, okay, let's try this, 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 and this. But instead I really found that after I was done the book, I, I felt really inspired. That was the biggest takeaway from it. And, uh, you know, I felt that there was, a lot of creativity that can be done in the studio and a lot of thinking outside of the box. And, and, uh, I, I, that really came across in your book and I really appreciated that. Um, so I was curious, like when it comes to being more creative in the studio and trying like really creative, innovative techniques, how do you typically go about approaching those things in the mixing stage? Is it something that you kind of just say to a band, Hey, we're going to do this or like, how do you feel out those situations to determine when you should try something that might be out there? Well, I had some great teachers when I was starting to mix who taught me the idea of using broad strokes when you mix. Um, There was a producer named Pat McCarthy, and um, I worked with him on some REM mixes. And I worked all day on these mixes. And he came in and he saw, this was during... Uh, the time when we were using a moving fader automation in an analog console, and he saw all these little movements on these faders. I had meticulously gone through and done these rides on all the faders, and he came in and he says, well, we're going to stop all that. And he, and uh, what I learned is that you can do so much with broad strokes. So I let the the outboard gear do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, and I, and I don't do, I don't get into those little details by hand. So for instance, if you have a very uneven vocal for, um, the, the approach that I'll take will be to put in a compression, some type of compression that will take care and even out all those things that you would normally have to do by hand to, to have, uh, to even it out. So I I use the compression to do most of the heavy lifting and to balance things. Um, Also, when I'm using stems or submixes in a template, I'll I'll use the submix for a global EQ or compression for that instrument. Instead of putting plugins on every single track, which I open up some people's sessions and I see this, this burden of every single track has some kind of compression instead of doing that then i i'll just put a a global eq or a global compression across the the submix and everything sounds so much better when you simplify so pat mccarthy taught taught me how to simplify and rick rubin really taught me how to uh, focus so you can take a, an element of your mix and decide from section to section what is the focus and let that come up front. A lot of times it'll be the vocals will be the focus. And the vocals you'll find on Rick Rubin's productions are generally very dry. And to have a dry vocal brings it right up in front of you. So the, the background music can be um, a blur even, and it can be unfocused. And if, if the background is unfocused, then whatever you have dry comes even closer to you. 
So that was something I learned with Rick. Also with Rick, he, he did something so simple and beautiful in the mixes that I, I do to this day. And that's something he called slippery fader. And that's where you take the stereo bus on an analog console and you have your entire mix going through that stereo bus and you just make minute changes to the level of the entire mix. Let's say when a chorus comes, you just push it up a couple dB for the chorus and then drop it back when it hits the next verse. You're only you're you're actually raising and lowering the level of the entire mix. And it's so si- simple but so effective to create dynamics in the songs. Uh, and you'll hear that also in his productions where they somehow the chorus always jumps out because he's doing these minute changes in the overall mix. It's a, it's a, it, these are broad strokes. And that I think uh, is uh, something that I learned from these people um, that I've really uh, carried with me through my career. That's awesome. Now, in terms of kind of doing more of the uh, experimental things when you're producing bands, I know that in your book you talk about shooting a piano with a rifle or yeah. <laughs> throwing guitars off cliffs and all that kind of stuff like that. How how do you convince a band that that's the right call to make? <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times we'll schedule a recording session and I'll be very careful to make sure we have enough time to do all the important stuff, you know, the foundation tracks and we won't have uh, an opportunity to do the experimenting until the end, but I will schedule a special day or even two days at the end of the, the recording session for us to have some fun. Everybody then while we're recording is looking forward to these last two days and everybody throughout the recording process is writing down little ideas or just dis- we're discussing, yeah, let's, uh, let's play a guitar through a light bulb, you know, or let's uh, throw a guitar off a cliff or let's set up the whole band in a, in a, the back of a truck and let's record it going across a bridge or, you know, whatever we we've done some crazy things, but those things don't happen unless all the work, all the, the important work is done that way. If our little experiments don't work out, we haven't lost time to get the real stuff done. And it, it's also a way to kind of let everyone off the hook. So it's easy to get a, a band on board when they know that they're going to get everything they want. Uh, and there might be a little extra fun at the end too. That's awesome. So most people will sign on and most people will participate. And in, in, in doing that too, it kind of opens up their own creative eye to uh, try some new things that they would normally not do in the studio. And it's very exciting to work this way. So it sounds like you've kind of, you've built up this, uh, this reputation for, uh, it almost sounds like when you're describing it like that of the last couple of days are planned to be like the fun days. It's almost like a, a retreat experience. Like the band comes in, they, they do all their work. And then at the end they have like a really good time and, and they get to let loose and party and all that stuff. Um, it is. It's like a reward at the end of hard work, you know? Yeah. And and would you say that that's like I was talking with Richard Cheeky uh, recently and he had talked about just having fun in the studio and how that has such a major impact on how people perceive you and how they want to continue to work with you after the fact. And and would you say that that's something that has definitely helped your your career and the longevity of it and, and the repeat customers and all, and all that? Sure. The, the clients that I've worked with, you know, uh, 25 years ago, I'm, I'm currently still working with them. They, they, we, uh, have, uh, long, um, histories together and, and continue to, to make great music. Um, I also think that the idea of having fun in the studio and having an adventure when you're recording it, the, the sound of that is actually imprinted into the music. And when you listen to some of these records, There's something going on there and you can't quite put your finger on it, but there's something special on these records. And I, and I have come to believe that the enthusiasm for recording is actually imprinted into the sounds that are recorded, whether or not these ideas, um, wacky ideas actually make it to the recordings. Just the fact that they, these things are happening, um, uh, you can really feel it. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. And even 
just watching some of the videos that you've posted online, if you just look around the room and see everybody's faces, like they're all just so into it. And, and you could tell that in that moment, that's the experience that they're taking home from, from their sessions. And, and that's what they're going to remember. Right. Have fun. Right. And yeah, these, these experiences, no one will ever forget, you know, uh, we we did throw a guitar off a cliff once on an album called Machines of Loving Grace, Guilt. And we, you know, at the end of our session, after everything was done, we dragged a, a Marshall rig up to uh, the top of a cliff um, in Malibu overlooking the ocean and uh, had a sacrificial guitar, got some crazy feedback on it with a really long instrument cable and threw it off the cliff and we recorded it. And it was just such a big event. Uh, it was, it was really fun. Uh, ultimately the sound of it never made it to the record because it just, <laughs> it just didn't fit anywhere. We tried it in as a segue or as a solo and it just did not fit, but it doesn't matter because everybody in that uh, who who was there for that will never ever ever forget it. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely can see how that would be possible. Yeah. So, in terms of like some of these really creative ideas like that, like who's inspiring these? How how is that coming up? You you'd mentioned that sometimes the artists come to you or they write down ideas. Like what 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 inspires you to try these new things? A lot of things happen just in normal normal conversation during normal conversation. Someone will mention something about a a, a venue uh, in uh, Germany under underground uh, in a salt mine, um, and I and I'll listen to that and I'll think, oh my god, that's going to be an incredible space to record in. So I'll kind of make a mental note of that. Or recently, I was at um, sitting at a meal in, with uh, some friends in Boston, and we were disco- discussing a. a a technique that I use during recording, which is, and this is a really simple thing to do. And I encourage anyone who uh, wants to do a little experiment to take an, uh, take two iPhones and, um, mic up one of them and have it on speakerphone and the other one in call, um, from the other one and, uh, just leave it open on, um, uh, you know, the speakerphone one, leave it open and mic'd and then have the singer sing um, in the first one. Yep. So you get this delay because it's bouncing off a satellite on the way to the second phone, right? So there's a natural delay. Mm-hmm. And if you have the singer with the iPhone step into the um, studio monitor while they're singing, then you get this feedback, which is really beautiful. So it's a great way to get a feedback. Anyway, we were sitting talking at dinner about this and Someone mentioned that uh, with uh, shortwave radio, the radio operators will transmit a signal uh, to the moon and bounce and actually reflect the radio signal off the moon and then back to Earth. So this is now there. There was I stuck a pin in that. That was (laughs) like, oh, my God, I'm going to do a moon delay and I haven't found the artist <laughs> to do it yet, but uh, that's my next challenge is to actually record a singer singing through uh, a microphone that is being transmitted to bounce off the moon and then come back. And then we'll record the radio as it's uh, as it's being transmitted to it. That's amazing. That will be an amazing day. <laughs> you, mu- you must have like a massive list of all of these ideas now. Oh my God. It's yeah. And it's crazy. The crazy thing is that a lot of these things can be done and actually are really, uh, fantastic when they, when, when they are done. Um, another one I did recently was, um, a band called Thunder Pussy in Seattle. Uh, we went to an abandoned nuclear power plant and went into one of the cooling towers and set them up uh, there was actually shore power there, so we were able to power up their amplifiers. And I brought a rig, a, an X32 Behringer interface, and my laptop with Pro Tools on it. And we recorded them in this cooling tower. And the the sound, and this is a massive tower, a uh, concrete, and the sound of this band playing in that uh, in that uh, giant tower was like nothing you ever heard before. That's crazy. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's awesome. I got I got to listen to that. I, I remember seeing some videos of it, uh, but I never heard the final the final results. So I got to check that record out. Yeah, it's coming out soon. Awesome. I, I would imagine that with a lot of these creative techniques, that you know there are some disasters that come from them or <laughs> horrible mistakes that may become. What's been a lesson? Has there ever been a time in the session that something drastically horrible has happened and 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 you've learned something from that experience? Ooh, let me think about that. And uh, no, I think everything has been pretty smooth sailing and I'm knocking on wood right now, <laughs> especially because I do a lot of experimenting with uh power uh and the outputs of amplifiers which can be can have a lot of voltage. So I uh so far have had very good luck. <laughs> I have blown up some speakers, I'll say, but um but no major disasters beyond that. Blowing up speakers is much better than blowing up people. So Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I'm extra, extra careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another yeah. thing I remember seeing was uh, you guys were hooking up some old, I think it was an old transistor or something like that, or a, I can't remember what it was. It was a power amp of some sort, and uh, the look on the guitar player's face as you plugged in the amp and powered it up, it was like, uh-oh, what's, what's going to happen here? Am I going to blow up or what? Like, get electrocuted? Like <laughs> <or? laughs> yeah, sometimes everyone needs to just step back a bit before we plug something in. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I try to be very careful, and if I'm doing something I'm not sure uh, is exactly safe. We'll do it in the safest possible way, um, just, to, just to be sure. That nothing <laughs> I, I almost wanted to ask if you just had like some sort of mechanical engineer on staff as a kind of just a security measure to go through the chains and, you know, figure out all the voltages. Well, you know, and so. I've thought about that, but I'm afraid that if someone actually knew what was going on, they'd say, don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I don't want anyone to stifle the creativity. So we just go, we'll, we'll just go. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any special tools or tips that have helped you with either the quality of your mixes or the workflow that you, you follow? You'd mentioned you've been going into, you've been doing this hybrid approach with mixing and that, yes. and that's helped. Um, when you when you're doing something like that, do, do you have to factor in like gain staging or a, a certain process with that kind of thing? You know, gain staging is a, is um, a big thing that, uh, and, and it's a a beast that I haven't tamed yet. And so I think that using a hybrid approach has helped with the bottlenecking that happens as you're submixing a uh, hundred tracks into two tracks. The first thing that I'll do when I get a new session is I bring the levels down on all the tracks, like minus 20, so that I have some room to move. And the the But the best thing that I've done so far has been to move out of the box uh, into this hybrid approach where the submixes then come up on the uh, analog desk, and that just gives you so much more room to move. Um, and so that's, that's uh, one thing I can say is that the the problems with gain staging uh, is an issue that I'm still experimenting to find out the best way to conquer. So uh, in saying that, then some of my mixes are they they are edgy with that digital edginess, um, which sometimes is very cool. Mm -hmm. But um, but to have a better control of it, it would be much better. Yeah. That makes sense. And what about when it comes to getting the low end right? I know that that's something a lot of people struggle with. They'll they'll do their mixes at home and then they'll go to their car and try it out there and the mix is completely out to lunch. So do you have any tips for getting low end controlled? Yes. And the the way that I normally do it is I check the mixes on as many systems as I can. Um, I have a set of M100 NHTs that are... Um, that are powered with the QSC amp and they're, they're ancient, but I'm really used to them as another option. I'm using the Genelec 80, 8351 a speakers and they are powered and they have a lot of low end, uh, or they represent the low end really well, let's say. So I, it, I think it's really, really important that your monitoring will give you 
the low end, uh, an accurate low end without hype. Um, the, the thing about the NHTs that I really like and the 8351s is that they don't sweeten the sound. They, you, it doesn't sparkle the, the high frequencies or, or warm up the low end because if, if it does that to your, um, monitoring, then you're not getting an act, act, accurate representation of, of your mix. So monitoring is everything. I can highly recommend these Genelec 8351, um, a, uh, uh, monitors. Um, I think they're relatively reasonably priced and they're really well built. Um, and, uh, so far they have been fantastic for mixing. Plus they have a software and a little microphone that comes with the, the monitors that you set up in your mix room and it, it will uh, scan the room and adjust the EQ to that room. So every time I move, if I move my mix rig to an, a new room, I just rescan it and the software will adjust the, the EQ on the speakers. It's really a great, great idea. That's great. What's a good lesson that you've learned from working with another producer or mixing engineer? Um, I have learned much from uh, several great engineers, uh, Alan Meyerson, um, Paul Lanny, Keith Cohen, um, the Lord Algies, uh, Rick Rubin, uh, but the and, and Pat McCarthy. But I think probably that most important lesson was this to simplify. And I use that when I mix today, um, simplifying and letting, letting, uh, the, the plugins, um, do most of the heavy lifting. It's, it's a, a great way to, to approach mixing. For sure. And do you end up mastering your own mixes when you're done or do you have a mastering engineer that you typically go to? I do have mastering engineers that I work with, but I like to do a little pre-mastering for, before I, uh, I send it out, which uh, makes the mixes sound great for the client. But then I might want to print a a mix without that um, pre-mastering just to send to mastering. The pre-mastering that I do is generally done with either the um, Isotope uh, Ozone 7 or 8, uh, which is a great program. Uh, if you're mixing in the box, I highly recommend it because the presets are so easy to use and they will really shape the the sound. Um, so it just sounds finished. The When I send out for mastering, I will use, there's a gentleman in Seattle that I use quite a bit, Steve Turnage. Uh, I also love Howie Weinberg and I love Tom Baker. So those are some of the mastering engineers that I send out mixes too. And, and when I can, I will, um, I'll, uh, attend the, the mastering sessions because I think it makes a big difference. For sure. I'm sure you learn a lot from just working in those rooms and hearing what the people who are working on your mixes are, are going to do to it. Yes. And, and in saying that too, whenever I have a chance to send out mixes in advance, uh, bef- while, while we're working on those mixes, uh, sending them to a mastering engineer and have the mastering engineer do a kind of a pre-master. Let's, let's say just a test master so that y- you get that back and you can make an adju- uh, adjustments to your mix to, to make the final master better. For sure. Now there's a lot of people who are listening to this podcast who might be just getting started in their careers. Do you have any advice for someone who's just getting started off with mixing? Yes. I think that you know, if you're starting out, you need as much experience, uh, as possible. And the way I would recommend to do that is to research the, the bands that are available through social media, um, new up and coming bands. I think a lot of them do need mixes. And if you offer to mix their projects for free, then that's a mix that you can add to your discography. And when you're starting out, discography is everything. So uh, every time you do a new mix, and it may be just one mix for the artist, just say, hey, I'll mix a song for free. 
um, then you get to try as many different genres or uh, uh, types of songs, uh, different approaches. You can experiment with that yourself. You can develop your own style. Plus, the the more you have on that discography, the better it looks for the people that will eventually be hiring you to do these mixes. So I, I suggest that you solicit bands to uh, offer free mixing in order to gain those bands' trust. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's going to take a little while to to get to a point where your name is the the name that's brought up when it comes to mixing. Well, you, you mentioned trust, and I think that that's a really important thing that contributes to getting paying clients. And and you know you need to have that trust built with the with the client to uh, make them feel confident in your ability to turn out really good results. Um, and you'd mentioned the idea of doing some free mixes, but I know that there's a lot of people who also fear the idea of asking people to do things for free because they think that well, if it's free, then it it almost seems like it's valueless and like there's no you know, there's no certainty it could be good and bands might be a little afraid to give someone who's an amateur their mixes. Like, do you have any uh, any suggestions for how to go about approaching that free mixing work to make it sound like it has some some value? I think that uh, you got to start somewhere. And yeah. if you're if you're an amateur, you may have to approach only amateur bands to start. Um, but then if you develop your website, a social presence and have that um, be as professional as possible, then uh, then new artists will come and and trust you more because you have had more experience. It's it's you know it's like the chicken or the egg. What's going to mm-hmm. come first? Well, I think that you do have to solicit unless you are doing your own music, which could help. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're doing your own music and doing your own mixes, it it might be misrepresenting what you would do for someone else, but you never know. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I know that you got a busy day ahead of you, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. So we should probably start to wrap up. How can people follow you online? I have a website that is uh, sylviamassey.com, and the name is spelled S-Y-L-V-I-A-M-A-S-S-Y. Uh, I also have a pretty active Facebook account uh, the same spelling of the name, and I post a lot of videos on there as I, I'm doing some experiments or their tutorials. Um, also, a YouTube channel that that I'm doing a, a lot more in. But the thing that I'm most excited about recently is the Twitch.tv account that I started, and I'll be um, doing a four-camera streaming of my mixing or tracking. I'm going to try to get online and do some streaming every day if I can manage it. That's awesome. So, but that's that's coming up. And so you can find uh, my channel on twitch.tv. That's amazing. And also for people who are listening, make sure you check out her book, Recording Unhinged. It's an amazing book. I, I, I absolutely loved it. Thank you very much. And uh, lastly, any cool projects that you're working on now that you can talk about? Uh, yeah, I finished mixing a band called Turbo Negro from, they're from um, Oslo in Very Norway. Cool. Yeah, and that's a fun band. The songs are amazing. And uh, I did um, some pretty edgy mixing on that record. So look forward to uh, hearing that one coming up soon. That's awesome. I'm uh, definitely going to check that one out for sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to to help us out and uh, give everyone some great advice here. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Take care. So that was my interview with Sylvia Massey. And man, she's awesome. I love her approach to recording and I love how creative she is. Like who else would think to use the moon as a delay tool, right? Like that is that is awesome. I, I just love the way she thinks about using anything to really just get a unique, creative, memorable sound. So I just love the way that she thinks about approaching recording. And I was so excited to be able to have that interview with her. So guys, make sure I mentioned it at the beginning, but make sure to check out her book. It's called Recording Unhinged, Creative and Unconventional Music Recording Techniques. And I'll leave a link in the show notes for where you can buy it. 
It's an awesome book. And if you loved what she had to say in this interview, you're going to love that book even more because there is so much good stuff in there. And it's not just her. She interviews a ton of amazing engineers that you're all very familiar with. And they all tell these really cool stories about being in the studio and trying to get different emotions out of artists and trying to just create these experimental techniques and using miking techniques and, and all sorts of psychological things to really get the best performance out of people. So I think it's an amazing book and you're going to learn a ton from it. So make sure to check out the link in the show notes for that. And also, like I mentioned at the beginning, if you haven't had a chance to check out MasterYourMix.com yet, make sure to check it out. I'm currently giving away a free copy of my Ultimate Mixing Blueprint, which is a guide to using EQ and compression in your mixes. So make sure to go to the website, sign up, and I'll send a free copy directly to your email. And once you do, I'll also add you to my mailing list. And every week, I'll send you new podcast episodes, video tutorials, tips and tricks, and a whole bunch of other great stuff to help you with improving your music production. So make sure to check out MasterYourMix.com. So that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you in the next episode. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.